Section 1 of The Penny Catechism, A Catechism of Christian Doctrine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. The Penny Catechism, A Catechism of Christian Doctrine by the Catholic Truth Society. Title page. A Catechism of Christian Doctrine, approved by the Archbishops and Bishops of England and Wales, and directed to be used in all their dioceses. This is eternal life, that they know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, 3. London, Catholic Truth Society. Summary of the Catechism of Christian Doctrine. 1. Faith. As to man, his first beginning, his last end. As to the belief. In God the Father, in Jesus Christ, in the Holy Ghost, in the Holy Catholic Church. 2. Hope. The Our Father. The Seven Blessings. To be hoped for and to be prayed for. The Hail Mary. Assistance of the Blessed Virgin and of the Angels and Saints. 3. Charity. The Commandments. First, of God. Second, of the Church. 4. The Sacraments. The seven great means of grace corresponding to 1. The birth. 2. The growth. 3. The nourishment. 4. The medicine. and 5. The journey of the soul. 6. The Christian priesthood. and 7. The Christian family. A. The virtues and contrary vices. B. The Christian's rule of life. C. The Christian's daily exercise. The spiritual house of the soul, says St. Augustine, 20 Sermo in Verb Sap, is built up in time and solemnly dedicated in eternity. Faith is the foundation, hope the walls, charity the roof or covering. The sacraments are the great means of grace or the chief instruments required for the building. The virtues, the Christian's rule of life, and the daily exercise may be likened to the adornment and furniture of the house. Nihil obstat, Guglielmus Canonis Sutcliffe, Imprimator, Franciscus Cardinalis Bern, Archiepiscopus West Monasteriensis, November the 12th, 1921. End of section 1. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Section 2 of The Penny Catechism, a Catechism of Christian Doctrine by the Catholic Truth Society. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, Part 1. Faith, Chapter 1. 1. Who made you? God made me. 2. Why did God make you? God made me to know him, love him, and serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in the next. 3. To whose image and likeness did God make you? God made me to his own image and likeness. 4. Is this likeness to God in your body or in your soul? This likeness to God is chiefly in my soul. 5. How is your soul like to God? My soul is like to God because it is a spirit and is immortal. 6. What do you mean when you say that your soul is immortal? When I say my soul is immortal, I mean that my soul can never die. 7. Of which must you take most care, of your body or of your soul? I must take most care of my soul, for Christ has said, What doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world, and suffer the loss of his own soul? Matthew sixteen, twenty-six. 26. 8. What must you do to save your soul? To save my soul I must worship God by faith, hope, and charity. That is, I must believe in him, I must hope in him, and I must love him with my whole heart. Chapter 2. 9. 
What is faith? Faith is a supernatural gift of God which enables us to believe without doubting whatever God has revealed. 10. Why must you believe whatever God has revealed? I must believe whatever God has revealed because God is the very truth and can neither deceive nor be deceived. 11. How are you to know what God has revealed? I am to know what God has revealed by the testimony, teaching and authority of the Catholic Church. 12. Who gave the Catholic Church divine authority to teach? Jesus Christ gave the Catholic Church divine authority to teach when he said, Go ye and teach all nations. Matthew 28, 19. The Apostles' Creed. 13. What are the chief things which God has revealed? The chief things which God has revealed are contained in the Apostles' Creed. 14. Say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. 15. How is the Apostles' Creed divided? The Apostles' Creed is divided into twelve parts or articles. First article of the Creed. 16. What is the first article of the Creed? The first article of the Creed is, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. 17. What is God? God is the Supreme Spirit who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. 18. Why is God called Almighty? God is called Almighty because he can do all things. With God all things are possible. Matthew 19.26 19. Why is God called Creator of Heaven and Earth? God is called Creator of Heaven and Earth because He made Heaven and Earth, and all things, out of nothing, by His Word. 20. Had God any beginning? God had no beginning. He always was, He is, and He always will be. 21. Where is God? God is everywhere. 22. Does God know and see all things? God knows and sees all things, even our most secret thoughts. 23. Has God any body? God has no body. He is a spirit. 24. Is there only one God? There is only one God. 25. Are there three persons in God? There are three persons in God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. 26. Are these three persons three gods? These three persons are not three gods. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are all one and the same God. 27. What is the mystery of the three persons in one God called? The mystery of the three persons in one God is called the mystery of the Blessed Trinity. 28. What do you mean by a mystery? By mystery, I mean a truth which is above reason, but revealed by God. 29. Is there any likeness to the Blessed Trinity in your soul? There is this likeness to the Blessed Trinity in my soul, that as in one God there are three persons, so in my one soul there are three powers. 30. Which are the three powers of your soul? The three powers of my soul are my memory, my understanding, and my will. The second article. 31. What is the second article of the Creed? The second article of the Creed is, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. 32. Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is God, the Son made man for us. 33. Is Jesus Christ truly God? Jesus Christ is truly God. 34. Why is Jesus Christ truly God? Jesus Christ is truly God because he has one and the same nature with God the Father. 35. Was Jesus Christ always God? 
Jesus Christ was always God, born of the Father from all eternity. 36. Which person of the Blessed Trinity is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. 37. Is Jesus Christ truly man? Jesus Christ is truly man. 38. Why is Jesus Christ truly man? Jesus Christ is truly man because he has the nature of man, having a body and soul like ours. 39. Was Jesus Christ always man? Jesus Christ was not always man. He has been man only from the time of his incarnation. 40. What do you mean by the incarnation? I mean by the incarnation that God the Son took to himself the nature of man. The Word was made flesh. John 1, 14. 41. How many natures are there in Jesus Christ? There are two natures in Jesus Christ, the nature of God and the nature of man. 42. Is there only one person in Jesus Christ? There is only one person in Jesus Christ, which is the person of God the Son. 43. Why was God the Son made man? God the Son was made man to redeem us from sin and hell and to teach us the way to heaven. 44. What does the holy name Jesus mean? The holy name Jesus means Saviour. Matthew 1, 21. 45. What does the name Christ mean? The name Christ means anointed. 46. Where is Jesus Christ? As God, Jesus Christ is everywhere. As God made man, he is in heaven and in the blessed sacrament of the altar. The third article. 47. What is the third article of the Creed? The third article of the Creed is who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary. 48. What does the third article mean? The third article means that God the Son took a body and soul like ours in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Ghost. 49. Had Jesus Christ any father on earth? Jesus Christ had no father on earth. Saint Joseph was only his guardian or foster father. 50. Where was our Saviour born? Our Saviour was born in a stable in Bethlehem. 51. On what day was our Saviour born? Our Saviour was born on Christmas Day. The fourth article. 52. What is the fourth article of the Creed? The fourth article of the Creed is Suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified, dead and buried. 53. What were the chief sufferings of Christ? The chief sufferings of Christ were, first, his agony and his sweat of blood in the garden. Secondly, his being scourged at the pillar and crowned with thorns. And thirdly, his carrying his cross, his crucifixion, and his death between two thieves. 54. What are the chief sufferings of our Lord called? The chief sufferings of our Lord are called the Passion of Jesus Christ. 55. Why did our Saviour suffer? Our Saviour suffered to atone for our sins and to purchase for us eternal life. 56. Why is Jesus Christ called our Redeemer? Jesus Christ is called our Redeemer because his precious blood is the price by which we were ransomed. 57. On what day did our Saviour die? Our Saviour died on Good Friday. 58. Where did our Saviour die? Our Saviour died on Mount Calvary. 59. Why do we make the sign of the cross? We make the sign of the cross first to put us in mind of the Blessed Trinity, and secondly to remind us that God the Son died for us on the cross. 60. In making the sign of the cross, how are we reminded of the Blessed Trinity? In making the sign of the cross, we are reminded of the Blessed Trinity by the words in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. 61. In making the sign of the cross, how are we reminded that Christ died for us on the cross? In making the sign of the cross, we are reminded that Christ died for us on the cross by the very form of the cross which we make upon ourselves. The fifth article. 62. What is the fifth article of the Creed? The fifth article of the Creed is, He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 63. What do you mean by the words, he descended into hell? 
By the words he descended into hell, I mean that as soon as Christ was dead, his blessed soul went down into that part of hell called limbo. 64. What do you mean by limbo? By limbo, I mean a place of rest, where the souls of the just who died before Christ were detained. 65. Why were the souls of the just detained in limbo? The souls of the just were detained in limbo because they could not go up to the kingdom of heaven till Christ had opened it for them. 66. What do you mean by the words, the third day he rose again from the dead? By the words, the third day he rose again from the dead, I mean that after Christ had been dead and buried part of three days, he raised his blessed body to life again on the third day. 67. On what day did Christ rise again from the dead? Christ rose again from the dead on Easter Sunday. The sixth article. 68. What is the sixth article of the creed? The sixth article of the creed is, He ascended into heaven, sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 69. What do you mean by the words, He ascended into heaven? By the words he ascended into heaven, I mean that our Saviour went up body and soul into heaven on Ascension Day, 40 days after his resurrection. 70. What do you mean by the words, sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty? By the words, sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, I do not mean that God the Father has hands, for he is a spirit, but I mean that Christ, as God, is equal to the Father and, as man, is in the highest place in heaven. End of section 2. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Section 3 of The Penny Catechism, A Catechism of Christian Doctrine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. The Penny Catechism, a Catechism of Christian Doctrine by the Catholic Truth Society. Chapter 2, Part 2. The Seventh Article. 71. What is the seventh article of the Creed? The seventh article of the Creed is, From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. 72. When will Christ come again? Christ will come again from heaven at the last day to judge all mankind. 73. What other things Christ will judge? Christ will judge our thoughts, words, works, and omissions. 74. What will Christ say to the wicked? Christ will say to the wicked, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew twenty-five forty-one. Seventy-five. 75. What will Christ say to the just? Christ will say to the just, Come, ye blessed of my Father, possess ye the kingdom prepared for you. Matthew twenty-five, thirty-four. 76. Will everyone be judged at death as well as at the last day? Everyone will be judged at death as well as at the last day. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment. Hebrews 9.27. The Eighth Article. What is the Eighth Article of the Creed? The Eighth Article of the Creed is, I believe, in the Holy Ghost. 78. Who is the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost is the third person of the Blessed Trinity. 79. From whom doth the Holy Ghost proceed? The Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. 80. Is the Holy Ghost equal to the Father and the Son? The Holy Ghost is equal to the Father and to the Son, for he is the same Lord and God as they are. 81. When did the Holy Ghost come down on the Apostles? The Holy Ghost came down on the Apostles on Whit Sunday in the form of parted tongues, as it were, of fire. Acts 2 3. 82. Why did the Holy Ghost come down on the Apostles? 
The Holy Ghost came down on the apostles to confirm their faith, to sanctify them, and to enable them to found the church. The Ninth Article 83. What is the Ninth Article of the Creed? The Ninth Article of the Creed is the Holy Catholic Church, the Communion of Saints. 84. What is the Catholic Church? The Catholic Church is the union of all the faithful under one head. 85. Who is the head of the Catholic Church? The head of the Catholic Church is Jesus Christ our Lord. 86. Has the Church a visible head on earth? The Church has a visible head on earth, the Bishop of Rome who is the Vicar of Christ. 87. Why is the Bishop of Rome the head of the Church? The Bishop of Rome is the head of the Church because he is the successor of St. Peter. 88. How do you know that Christ appointed St. Peter to be the head of the Church? I know that Christ appointed St. Peter to be the head of the Church because Christ said to him, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my Church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and to thee I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19. 89. What is the Bishop of Rome called? The Bishop of Rome is called the Pope, which word signifies Father. 90. Is the Pope the spiritual father of all Christians? The Pope is the spiritual father of all Christians. 91. Is the Pope the shepherd and teacher of all Christians? The Pope is the shepherd and teacher of all Christians, because Christ made St. Peter the shepherd of the whole flock, when he said, Feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He also prayed that his faith might never fail, and commanded him to confirm his brethren. John 21, 15 to 17. 92. Is the Pope infallible? The Pope is infallible. 93. What do you mean when you say that the Pope is infallible? When I say that the Pope is infallible, I mean that the Pope cannot err when, as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole Church. 94. Has the Church of Christ any marks by which we may know her? The Church of Christ has four marks by which we may know her. She is one. She is holy. She is Catholic. She is apostolic. 95. How is the Church one? The Church is one because all her members agree in one faith, have all the same sacrifice and sacraments, and are all united under one head. 96. How is the Church holy? The Church is holy because she teaches a holy doctrine, offers to all the means of holiness, and is distinguished by the eminent holiness of so many thousands of her children. 97. What does the word Catholic mean? The word Catholic means universal. 98. How is the Church Catholic or universal? The Church is Catholic or universal because she subsists in all ages, teaches all nations, and is the one ark of salvation for all. 99. How is the Church apostolic? The Church is apostolic because she holds the doctrines and traditions of the apostles, and because, through the unbroken succession of her pastors, she derives her orders and her mission from them. 100. Can the Church err in what she teaches? The Church cannot err in what she teaches as to faith or morals, for she is our infallible guide in both. 101. How do you know that the Church cannot err in what she teaches? I know that the Church cannot err in what she teaches, because Christ promised that the gates of hell shall never prevail against his Church, that the Holy Ghost shall teach her all things, and that he himself will be with her all days, even to the consummation of the world. Matthew sixteen eighteen, John fourteen sixteen to 26 Matthew 28, 20 102 what do you mean by the communion of saints? By the communion of saints, I mean that all the members of the church in heaven, on earth, and in purgatory are in communion with each other, as being one body in Jesus Christ. 103. How are the faithful on earth in communion with each other? The faithful on earth are in communion with each other by professing the same faith, obeying the same authority and assisting each other with their prayers and good works. 104. 
How are we in communion with the saints in heaven? We are in communion with the saints in heaven by honouring them as the glorified members of the church, and also by our praying to them, and by their praying for us. 105. How are we in communion with the souls in purgatory? We are in communion with the souls in purgatory by helping them with our prayers and good works. It is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from sins. 2 Maccabees 12. 46. 106. What is purgatory? Purgatory is a place where souls suffer for a time after death on account of their sins. 107. What souls go to purgatory? Those souls go to purgatory that depart this life in venial sin, or that have not fully paid the debt of temporal punishment due to those sins of which the guilt has been forgiven. 108. What is temporal punishment? Temporal punishment is punishment which will have an end, either in this world or in the world to come. 109. How do you prove that there is a purgatory? I prove that there is a purgatory from the constant teaching of the Church and from the doctrine of Holy Scripture, which declares that God will render to every man according to his works, that nothing defiled shall enter heaven, and that some will be saved, yet so as by fire. Matthew 16.27 Apocalypse 21.27 1 Corinthians 3.15 The Tenth Article 110. What is the Tenth Article of the Creed? The Tenth Article of the Creed is the forgiveness of sins. 111. What do you mean by the forgiveness of sins? By the forgiveness of sins, I mean that Christ has left the power of forgiving sins to the pastors of his church. John 20.23 20, 112. By what means are sins forgiven? Sins are forgiven principally by the sacraments of baptism and penance. 113. What is sin? Sin is an offence against God by any thought, word, deed or omission against the law of God. 114. How many kinds of sin are there? There are two kinds of sin, original sin and actual sin. 115. What is original sin? Original sin is that guilt and stain of sin which we inherit from Adam, who is the origin and head of all mankind. 116. What was the sin committed by Adam? The sin committed by Adam was the sin of disobedience when he ate the forbidden fruit. 117. Have all mankind contracted the guilt and stain of original sin? All mankind have contracted the guilt and stain of original sin, except the Blessed Virgin, who, through the merits of her Divine Son, was conceived without the least guilt or stain of original sin. 118. What is this privilege of the Blessed Virgin called? This privilege of the Blessed Virgin is called the Immaculate Conception. 119. What is actual sin? Actual sin is every sin which we ourselves commit. 120. How is actual sin divided? Actual sin is divided into mortal sin and venial sin. 121. What is mortal sin? Mortal sin is a grievous offence against God. 122. Why is it called mortal sin? It is called mortal sin because it kills the soul and deserves hell. 123. How does mortal sin kill the soul? Mortal sin kills the soul by depriving it of sanctifying grace, which is the supernatural life of the soul. 124. Is it a great evil to fall into mortal sin? It is the greatest of all evils to fall into mortal sin. 125. Where will they go who die in mortal sin? They who die in mortal sin will go to hell for all eternity. 126. What is venial sin? Venial sin is an offence which does not kill the soul, yet displeases God and often leads to mortal sin. 127. Why is it called venial sin? It is called venial sin because it is more easily pardoned than mortal sin. The Eleventh Article 128. What is the Eleventh Article of the Creed? 
The eleventh article of the Creed is the resurrection of the body. 129. What do you mean by the resurrection of the body? By the resurrection of the body, I mean that we shall all rise again with the same bodies at the day of judgment. The twelfth article. 130. What is the twelfth article of the Creed? The twelfth article of the Creed is life everlasting. 131. What does life everlasting mean? Life everlasting means that the good shall live forever in the glory and happiness of heaven. 132. What is the glory and happiness of heaven? The glory and happiness of heaven is to see, love and enjoy God forever. 133. What does the scripture say of the happiness of heaven? The scripture says of the happiness of heaven, That eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man, what things God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, 134. Shall not the wicked also live forever? The wicked also shall live and be punished forever in the fire of hell. End of section 3. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Section 4 of The Penny Catechism, A Catechism of Christian Doctrine, by the Catholic Truth Society. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Hope, Chapter 3. 135. Will faith alone save us? Faith alone will not save us without good works. We must also have hope and charity. 136. What is hope? Hope is a supernatural gift of God, by which we firmly trust that God will give us eternal life, and all the means necessary to obtain it if we do what he requires of us. 137. Why must we hope in God? We must hope in God because he is infinitely good, infinitely powerful, and faithful to his promises. 138. Can we do any good work of ourselves towards our salvation? We can do no good work of ourselves towards our salvation. We need the help of God's grace. 139. What is grace? Grace is a supernatural gift of God freely bestowed upon us for our sanctification and salvation. 140. How must we obtain God's grace? We must obtain God's grace chiefly by prayer and the holy sacraments. Prayer. 141. What is prayer? Prayer is the raising up of the mind and heart to God. 142. How do we raise up our mind and heart to God? We raise up our mind and heart to God by thinking of God, by adoring, praising and thanking Him, and by begging of Him all blessings for soul and body. 143. Do those pray well who, at their prayers, think neither of God nor of what they say? Those who, at their prayers, think neither of God nor of what they say, do not pray well, but they offend God if their distractions are willful. 144. Which is the best of all prayers? The best of all prayers is the Our Father, or the Lord's Prayer. 145. Who made the Lord's Prayer? Jesus Christ himself made the Lord's Prayer. 146. Say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. 147. In the Lord's Prayer, who is called our Father? In the Lord's Prayer, God is called our Father. 148. Why is God called our Father? God is called our Father because he is the Father of all Christians, whom he has made his children by holy baptism. 149. Is God also the Father of all mankind? God is also the Father of all mankind because he made them all, and loves and preserves them all. 150. 
Why do we say our father and not my father? We say our father and not my father because, being all brethren, we are to pray not for ourselves only, but also for all others. 151. When we say, Hallowed be thy name, what do we pray for? When we say, Hallowed be thy name, we pray that God may be known, loved, and served by all his creatures. 152. When we say, Thy kingdom come, what do we pray for? When we say, Thy kingdom come, we pray that God may come and reign in the hearts of all by his grace in this world, and bring us all hereafter to his heavenly kingdom. 153. When we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, what do we pray for? When we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we pray that God may enable us, by his grace, to do his will in all things, as the blessed do in heaven. 154. When we say, Give us this day our daily bread, what do we pray for? When we say, Give us this day our daily bread, we pray that God may give us daily all that is necessary for soul and body. 155. When we say, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us, what do we pray for? When we say, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us, we pray that God may forgive us our sins as we forgive others the injuries they do to us. 156. When we say, Lead us not into temptation, what do we pray for? When we say, lead us not into temptation, we pray that God may give us grace not to yield to temptation. 157. When we say, deliver us from evil, what do we pray for? When we say, deliver us from evil, we pray that God may free us from all evil, both of soul and body. 158. Should we ask the angels and saints to pray for us? We should ask the angels and saints to pray for us, because they are our friends and brethren, and because their prayers have great power with God. 159. How can we show that the angels and saints know what passes on earth? We can show that the angels and saints know what passes on earth from the words of Christ. There shall be joy before the angels of God upon one sinner doing penance. Luke 15.10 160. What is the chief prayer to the Blessed Virgin which the Church uses? The chief prayer to the Blessed Virgin which the Church uses is the Hail Mary. 161. Say the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 162. Who made the first part of the Hail Mary? The angel Gabriel and Saint Elizabeth, inspired by the Holy Ghost, made the first part of the Hail Mary. 163. Who made the second part of the Hail Mary? The Church of God, guided by the Holy Ghost, made the second part of the Hail Mary. 164. Why should we frequently say the Hail Mary? We should frequently say the Hail Mary to put us in mind of the incarnation of the Son of God, and to honour our Blessed Lady, the Mother of God. 165. Have we another reason for often saying the Hail Mary? We have another reason for often saying the Hail Mary, to ask our Blessed Lady to pray for us sinners at all times, but especially at the hour of our death. 166. Why does the Catholic Church show great devotion to the Blessed Virgin? The Catholic Church shows great devotion to the Blessed Virgin because she is the Immaculate Mother of God. 167. How is the Blessed Virgin Mother of God? The Blessed Virgin is Mother of God because Jesus Christ, her Son, who is born of her as man, is not only man, but is also truly God. 168. Is the Blessed Virgin our Mother also? The Blessed Virgin is our mother also, because, being the brethren of Jesus, we are the children of Mary. Charity, Chapter 4, The Commandments of God 169. What is charity? Charity is a supernatural gift of God by which we love God above all things, and our neighbour as ourselves for God's sake. 170. Why must we love God? We must love God because he is infinitely good in himself and infinitely good to us. 171. 
How do we show that we love God? We show that we love God by keeping his commandments, for Christ says, If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. 172. How many commandments are there? There are ten commandments. 173. Say the Ten Commandments. I am the Lord thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. 1. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven thing, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not adore them, nor serve them. 2. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. 3. Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. 4. Honour thy father and thy mother. 5. Thou shalt not kill. 6. Thou shalt not commit adultery. 7. Thou shalt not steal. 8. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. 9. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife. 10. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's goods. 174. Who gave the Ten Commandments? God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses in the Old Law, and Christ confirmed them in the New. 1. 175. What is the First Commandment? The First Commandment is, I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven thing, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not adore them, nor serve them. 176. What are we commanded to do by the first commandment? By the first commandment, we are commanded to worship the one true and living God by faith, hope, charity and religion. 177. What are the sins against faith? The sins against faith are all false religions, willful doubt, disbelief or denial of any article of faith, and also culpable ignorance of the doctrines of the church. 178. How do we expose ourselves to the danger of losing our faith? We expose ourselves to the danger of losing our faith by neglecting our spiritual duties, reading bad books, going to non-Catholic schools and taking part in the services or prayers of a false religion. 179. What are the sins against hope? The sins against hope are despair and presumption. 180. What are the chief sins against religion? The chief sins against religion are the worship of false gods or idols and the giving to any creature whatsoever the honour which belongs to God alone. 181. Does the first commandment forbid the making of images? The first commandment does not forbid the making of images, but the making of idols. That is, it forbids us to make images to be adored or honoured as gods. 182. Does the first commandment forbid dealing with the devil and superstitious practices? The first commandment forbids all dealing with the devil and superstitious practices, such as consulting spiritualists and fortune tellers and trusting to charms, omens, dreams and such like fooleries. 183. Are all sins of sacrilege and simony also forbidden by the first commandment? All sins of sacrilege and simony are also forbidden by the first commandment. 184. Is it forbidden to give divine honour or worship to the angels and saints? It is forbidden to give divine honour or worship to the angels and saints, for this belongs to God alone. 185. What kind of honour or worship should we pay to the angels and saints? We should pay to the angels and saints an inferior honour or worship, for this is due to them as the servants and special friends of God. 186. What honour should we give to relics, crucifixes and holy pictures? We should give to relics, crucifixes and holy pictures a relative honour, as they relate to Christ and his saints and are memorials of them. 187. Do we pray to relics or images? We do not pray to relics or images, for they can neither see, nor hear, nor help us. 
2. 188. What is the second commandment? The second commandment is, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. 189. What are we commanded by the second commandment? By the second commandment we are commanded to speak with reverence of God and all holy persons and things, and to keep our lawful oaths and vows. 190. What does the second commandment forbid? The second commandment forbids all false, rash, unjust and unnecessary oaths, as also blaspheming, cursing and profane words. 191. Is it ever lawful to swear or to take an oath? It is lawful to swear or to take an oath, only when God's honour, or our own, or our neighbour's good requires it. 3. 192. What is the third commandment? The third commandment is, Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. 193. What are we commanded by the third commandment? By the third commandment we are commanded to keep the Sunday holy. 194. How are we to keep the Sunday holy? We are to keep the Sunday holy by hearing Mass and resting from servile works. 195. Why are we commanded to rest from servile works? We are commanded to rest from servile works that we may have time and opportunity for prayer, going to the sacraments, hearing instructions, and reading good books. 4. 196. What is the fourth commandment? The fourth commandment is, Honour thy father and thy mother. 197. What are we commanded by the fourth commandment? By the fourth commandment, we are commanded to love, reverence, and obey our parents in all that is not sin. 198. Are we commanded to obey our parents only? We are commanded to obey not only our parents, but also our bishops and pastors, the civil authorities, and our lawful superiors. 199. Are we bound to assist our parents in their wants? We are bound to assist our parents in their wants, both spiritual and temporal. 200. Are we bound in justice to contribute to the support of our pastors? We are bound in justice to contribute to the support of our pastors. For St. Paul says, The Lord ordained that they who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9.14 201. What is the duty of parents towards their children? The duty of parents towards their children is to provide for them, to instruct and correct them, and to give them a good Catholic education. 202. What is the duty of masters, mistresses, and other superiors? The duty of masters, mistresses, and other superiors is to take proper care of those under their charge, and to enable them to practice their religious duties. 203. What does the fourth commandment forbid? The fourth commandment forbids all contempt, stubbornness and disobedience to our parents and lawful superiors. 204. Is it sinful to belong to a secret society? It is sinful to belong to any secret society that plots against the church or state, or to any society that by reason of its secrecy is condemned by the church. For St. Paul says... Let every soul be subject to the higher powers. He that resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist purchase to themselves damnation. Romans 13, 1 and 2. 5. 205. What is the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment is, Thou shalt not kill. 206. What does the fifth commandment forbid? The fifth commandment forbids all willful murder, fighting, quarrelling and injurious words, and also scandal and bad example. 207. Does the fifth commandment forbid anger? The fifth commandment forbids anger, and still more, hatred and revenge. 208. Why are scandal and bad example forbidden by the fifth commandment? Scandal and bad example are forbidden by the fifth commandment because they lead to the injury and spiritual death of our neighbour's soul. 6. 209. What is the sixth commandment? 
The sixth commandment is, Thou shalt not commit adultery. 210. What does the sixth commandment forbid? The sixth commandment forbids all sins of impurity with another's wife or husband. 211. Does the sixth commandment forbid whatever is contrary to holy purity? The sixth commandment forbids whatever is contrary to holy purity, in looks, words, or actions. 212. Are immodest plays and dances forbidden by the sixth commandment? Immodest plays and dances are forbidden by the Sixth Commandment, and it is sinful to look at them. 213. Does the Sixth Commandment forbid immodest songs, books, and pictures? The Sixth Commandment forbids immodest songs, books, and pictures, because they are most dangerous to the soul, and lead to mortal sin. 7. 214. What is the Seventh Commandment? The Seventh Commandment is, Thou shalt not steal. 215. What does the seventh commandment forbid? The seventh commandment forbids all unjust taking away or keeping what belongs to another. 216. Is all manner of cheating in buying and selling forbidden by the seventh commandment? All manner of cheating in buying and selling is forbidden by the seventh commandment, and also every other way of wronging our neighbour. 217. Are we bound to restore ill-gotten goods? We are bound to restore ill-gotten goods if we are able, or else the sin will not be forgiven. We must also pay our debts. 218. Is it dishonest in servants to waste their master's time or property? It is dishonest in servants to waste their master's time or property, because it is wasting what is not their own. 8. 219. What is the Eighth Commandment? The Eighth Commandment is, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. 220. What does the Eighth Commandment forbid? The Eighth Commandment forbids all false testimony, rash judgment, and lies. 221. Are calumny and detraction forbidden by the Eighth Commandment? Calumny and detraction are forbidden by the Eighth Commandment, and also tale-bearing, and any words which injure our neighbour's character. 222. If you have injured your neighbour by speaking ill of him, what are you bound to do? If I have injured my neighbour by speaking ill of him, I am bound to make him satisfaction, by restoring his good name as far as I can. 9. 223. What is the Ninth Commandment? The Ninth Commandment is, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife. 224. What does the Ninth Commandment forbid? The Ninth Commandment forbids all willful consent to impure thoughts and desires, and all willful pleasure in the irregular motions of the flesh. 225. What sins commonly lead to the breaking of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments? The sins that commonly lead to the breaking of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments are gluttony, drunkenness, and intemperance, and also idleness, bad company, and the neglect of prayer. 10. 226. What is the Tenth Commandment? The Tenth Commandment is, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's goods. 227. What does the Tenth Commandment forbid? The Tenth Commandment forbids all envious and covetous thoughts and unjust desires of our neighbour's goods and profits. End of section 4. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Section 5 of The Penny Catechism, A Catechism of Christian Doctrine, by the Catholic Truth Society. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Chapter 5, The Commandments of the Church. 228. Are we bound to obey the Church? We are bound to obey the Church, because Christ has said to the pastors of the Church, he that heareth you heareth me, and he that despiseth you despiseth me. Luke 10.16 229. What are the chief commandments of the Church? The chief commandments of the Church are 1. 
to keep the Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation holy by hearing Mass and resting from servile works. 2. To keep the days of fasting and abstinence appointed by the Church. 3. To go to confession at least once a year. 4. To receive the Blessed Sacrament at least once a year, and that at Easter or thereabouts. 5. To contribute to the support of our pastors. 6. Not to marry within certain degrees of kindred, nor to solemnise marriage at the forbidden times. 230. What is the first commandment of the Church? The first commandment of the Church is to keep the Sundays and holy days of obligation holy, by hearing Mass and resting from servile works. 231. Which are the holy days of obligation observed in England? The Holy Days of Obligation observed in England are Christmas Day, the Circumcision, the Epiphany, the Ascension, Corpus Christi, Saints Peter and Paul, the Assumption of Our Lady, and All Saints. 232. Is it a mortal sin to neglect to hear Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation? It is a mortal sin to neglect to hear Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. 233. Are parents, masters, and mistresses bound to provide that those under their charge shall hear Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation? Parents, masters, and mistresses are bound to provide that those under their charge shall hear Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. 234. What is the second commandment of the Church? The second commandment of the Church is to keep the days of fasting and abstinence appointed by the Church. 235. What are fasting days? Fasting days are days on which we are allowed to take only one full meal. 236. Which are the fasting days? The fasting days are the weekdays of Lent, certain vigils, and the ember days. Footnote 1. Lent ends at midday on Holy Saturday. The vigils are those of Pentecost, the Assumption, All Saints, and Christmas. 237. What are days of abstinence? Days of abstinence are days on which we are forbidden to take flesh meat and soups made from meat. 238. Which are the days of abstinence? The days of abstinence are all Fridays except any Friday on which a holy day of obligation falls. The Wednesdays of Lent in England, the Four Vigils unless one falls on a Sunday, and the Ember Days. Footnote 2. When December the 26th falls on a Friday, the abstinence is at present dispensed in England. 239. Why does the Church command us to fast and abstain? The Church commands us to fast and abstain, that so we may mortify the flesh and satisfy God for our sins. 240. What is the third commandment of the Church? The third commandment of the Church is to go to confession at least once a year. 241. How soon are children bound to go to confession? Children are bound to go to confession as soon as they have come to the use of reason and are capable of mortal sin. 242. When are children generally supposed to come to the use of reason? Children are generally supposed to come to the use of reason about the age of seven years. 243. What is the fourth commandment of the church? The fourth commandment of the Church is to receive the Blessed Sacrament at least once a year, and that at Easter or thereabouts. 244. How soon are Christians bound to receive the Blessed Sacrament? Christians are bound to receive the Blessed Sacrament as soon as they are capable of distinguishing the body of Christ from ordinary bread, and are judged to be sufficiently instructed. 245. What is the fifth commandment of the Church? The fifth commandment of the Church is to contribute to the support of our pastors. 246. Is it a duty to contribute to the support of religion? 
It is a duty to contribute to the support of religion according to our means, so that God may be duly honoured and worshipped and the kingdom of his church extended. 247. What is the sixth commandment of the church? The sixth commandment of the church is not to marry within certain degrees of kindred, nor to solemnise marriage at the forbidden times. 248. Which are the times in which it is forbidden to marry with solemnity? The times in which it is forbidden to marry with solemnity, without special leave, are from the first Sunday of Advent till after Christmas Day, and from Ash Wednesday till after Easter Sunday. The Sacraments, Chapter 6. 249. What is a sacrament? A sacrament is an outward sign of inward grace, ordained by Jesus Christ, by which grace is given to our souls. 250. Do the sacraments always give grace? The sacraments always give grace to those who receive them worthily. 251. Whence have the sacraments the power of giving grace? The sacraments have the power of giving grace from the merits of Christ's precious blood, which they apply to our souls. 252. Ought we to have a great desire to receive the sacraments? We ought to have a great desire to receive the sacraments, because they are the chief means of our salvation. 253. Is a character given to the soul by any of the sacraments? A character is given to the soul by the sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and holy order. 254. What is a character? A character is a mark or seal on the soul, which cannot be effaced, and therefore the sacrament conferring it may not be repeated. 255. How many sacraments are there? There are seven sacraments. Baptism, Confirmation, Holy Eucharist, Penance, Extreme Unction, Holy Order, and Matrimony. 1. 256. What is Baptism? Baptism is a sacrament which cleanses us from original sin, makes us Christians, children of God, and members of the Church. 257. Does baptism also forgive actual sins? Baptism also forgives actual sins, with all punishment due to them, when it is received in proper dispositions by those who have been guilty of actual sin. 258. Who is the ordinary minister of baptism? The ordinary minister of baptism is a priest, but anyone may baptise in case of necessity, when a priest cannot be had. 259. How is baptism given? Baptism is given by pouring water on the head of the child, saying at the same time these words, I baptise thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. 260. What do we promise in baptism? We promise in baptism to renounce the devil and all his works and pomps. 261. Is baptism necessary for salvation? Baptism is necessary for salvation because Christ has said, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. John 3, 5. 2. 262. What is confirmation? Confirmation is a sacrament by which we receive the Holy Ghost in order to make us strong and perfect Christians and soldiers of Jesus Christ. 263. Who is the ordinary minister of confirmation? The ordinary minister of confirmation is a bishop. 264. How does the bishop administer the sacrament of confirmation? The bishop administers the sacrament of confirmation by praying that the Holy Ghost may come down upon those who are to be confirmed, and by laying his hand on them, and making the sign of the cross with chrism on their foreheads, at the same time pronouncing certain words. 265. What are the words used in confirmation? The words used in confirmation are these. I sign thee with the sign of the cross, and I confirm thee with the chrism of salvation, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 3. 266. What is the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist? 
The sacrament of the Holy Eucharist is the true body and blood of Jesus Christ, together with his soul and divinity, under the appearances of bread and wine. 267. How are the bread and wine changed into the body and blood of Christ? The bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ by the power of God, to whom nothing is impossible or difficult. 268. When are the bread and wine changed into the body and blood of Christ? The bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ when the words of consecration, ordained by Jesus Christ, are pronounced by the priest in Holy Mass. 269. Why has Christ given himself to us in the Holy Eucharist? Christ has given himself to us in the Holy Eucharist to be the life and the food of our souls. He that eateth me, the same also shall live by me. He that eateth this bread shall live for ever. John 6, verses 58 and 59. 270. Is Christ received whole and entire under either kind alone? Christ is received whole and entire under either kind alone. 271. In order to receive the Blessed Sacrament worthily, what is required? In order to receive the Blessed Sacrament worthily, it is required that we be in a state of grace and fasting from midnight. 272. What is it to be in a state of grace? To be in a state of grace is to be free from mortal sin and pleasing to God. 273. Is it a great sin to receive Holy Communion in mortal sin? It is a great sin to receive Holy Communion in mortal sin. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh judgment to himself. 1 Corinthians 11, 29. 274. Is the Blessed Eucharist a sacrament only? The Blessed Eucharist is not a sacrament only, it is also a sacrifice. 275. What is a sacrifice? A sacrifice is the offering of a victim by a priest to God alone, in testimony of his being the Sovereign Lord of all things. 276. What is the sacrifice of the new law? The sacrifice of the new law is the Holy Mass. 277. What is the Holy Mass? The Holy Mass is the sacrifice of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, really present on the altar under the appearances of bread and wine, and offered to God for the living and the dead. 278. Is the Holy Mass one and the same sacrifice with that of the cross? The Holy Mass is one and the same sacrifice with that of the cross, inasmuch as Christ, who offered himself a bleeding victim, on the cross, to his heavenly Father, continues to offer himself in an unbloody manner on the altar, through the ministry of his priests. 279. For what ends is the sacrifice of the Mass offered? The sacrifice of the Mass is offered for four ends. First, to give supreme honour and glory to God. Secondly, to thank him for all his benefits. Thirdly, to satisfy God for our sins and to obtain the grace of repentance. And fourthly, to obtain all other graces and blessings through Jesus Christ. 280. Is the Mass also a memorial of the passion and death of our Lord? The Mass is also a memorial of the passion and death of our Lord. For Christ at his last supper said, Do this for a commemoration of me. Luke twenty two nineteen. End of section five. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Section six of the Penny Catechism, a Catechism of Christian Doctrine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. The Penny Catechism, a Catechism of Christian Doctrine, by the Catholic Truth Society, J. 
Chapter 6, Part 2. 4. 281. What is the sacrament of penance? Penance is a sacrament whereby the sins, whether mortal or venial, which we have committed after baptism, are forgiven. 282. Does the sacrament of penance increase the grace of God in the soul? The sacrament of penance increases the grace of God in the soul, besides forgiving sin. We should, therefore, often go to confession. 283. When did our Lord institute the sacrament of penance? Our Lord instituted the sacrament of penance when he breathed on his apostles and gave them power to forgive sins, saying, Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. John 20, 23. 284. How does the priest forgive sins? The priest forgives sins by the power of God when he pronounces the words of absolution. 285. What are the words of absolution? The words of absolution are, I absolve thee from thy sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. 286. Are any conditions of forgiveness required on the part of the penitent? Three conditions for forgiveness are required on the part of the penitent. Contrition, confession, and satisfaction. 287. What is contrition? Contrition is a hearty sorrow for our sins, because by them we have offended so good a God, together with a firm purpose of amendment. 288. What is a firm purpose of amendment? A firm purpose of amendment is a resolution to avoid, by the grace of God, not only sin, but also the dangerous occasions of sin. 289. How may we obtain a hearty sorrow for our sins? We may obtain a hearty sorrow for our sins by earnestly praying for it, and by making use of such considerations as may lead us to it. 290. What consideration concerning God will lead us to sorrow for our sins? This consideration concerning God will lead us to sorrow for our sins, that by our sins we have offended God, who is infinitely good in himself and infinitely good to us. 291. What consideration concerning our Saviour will lead us to sorrow for our sins? This consideration concerning our Saviour will lead us to sorrow for our sins, that our Saviour died for our sins, and that those who sin grievously crucify again to themselves the Son of God, making him a mockery. Hebrews 6, 8. 292. Is sorrow for our sins, because by them we have lost heaven and deserved hell, sufficient when we go to confession? Sorrow for our sins, because by them we have lost heaven and deserved hell, is sufficient when we go to confession. 293. What is a perfect contrition? Perfect contrition is sorrow for sin arising purely from the love of God. 294. What special value has perfect contrition? Perfect contrition has this special value, that by it our sins are forgiven immediately, even before we confess them. But nevertheless, if they are mortal, we are strictly bound to confess them afterwards. 295. What is confession? Confession is to accuse ourselves of our sins to a priest approved by the bishop. 296. What if a person willfully conceal a mortal sin in confession? If a person willfully conceal a mortal sin in confession, he is guilty of a great sacrilege, by telling a lie to the Holy Ghost in making a bad confession. 297. How many things have we to do in order to prepare for confession? We have four things to do in order to prepare for confession. First, we must heartily pray for grace to make a good confession. Secondly, we must carefully examine our conscience. Thirdly, we must take time and care to make a good act of contrition. And fourthly, we must resolve by the help of God to renounce our sins and to begin a new life for the future. 298. What is satisfaction? Satisfaction is doing the penance given us by the priest. 299. Does the penance given by the priest always make full satisfaction for our sins? 
The penance given by the priest does not always make full satisfaction for our sins. We should therefore add to it other good works and penances, and try to gain indulgences. 300. What is an indulgence? An indulgence is a remission granted by the Church of the temporal punishment which often remains due to sin after its guilt has been forgiven. 5. 301. What is the sacrament of extreme unction? The sacrament of extreme unction is the anointing of the sick with holy oil, accompanied with prayer. 302. When is extreme unction given? Extreme unction is given when we are in danger of death by sickness. 303. What are the effects of the sacrament of extreme unction? The effects of the sacrament of extreme unction are to comfort and strengthen the soul, to remit sin, and even to restore health when God sees it to be expedient. 304. What authority is there in Scripture for the sacrament of extreme unction? The authority in Scripture for the sacrament of extreme unction is in the fifth chapter of St. James, where it is said, Is any one sick among you? Let him bring in the priests of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick man, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he be in sins, they shall be forgiven him. James 5, 14 and 15. 6. 305. What is the sacrament of holy order? Holy order is the sacrament by which bishops, priests, and other ministers of the church are ordained, and receive power and grace to perform their sacred duties. 7. 306. What is the sacrament of matrimony? Matrimony is the sacrament which sanctifies the contract of a Christian marriage, and gives a special grace to those who receive it worthily. 307. What special grace does the sacrament of matrimony give to those who receive it worthily? The sacrament of matrimony gives to those who receive it worthily a special grace, to enable them to bear the difficulties of their state, to love and be faithful to one another, and to bring up their children in the fear of God. 308. Is it a sacrilege to contract marriage in mortal sin, or in disobedience to the laws of the Church? It is a sacrilege to contract marriage in mortal sin, or in disobedience to the laws of the Church, and, instead of a blessing, the guilty parties draw down upon themselves the anger of God. Note 1. For the marriage of a Catholic to be valid, there must be present 1. Either the bishop or the parish priest, or another priest duly delegated, and two, two witnesses. 309. What is a mixed marriage? A mixed marriage is a marriage between a Catholic and one who, though baptised, does not profess the Catholic faith. 310. Has the Church always forbidden mixed marriages? The Church has always forbidden mixed marriages and considered them unlawful and pernicious. 311. Does the Church sometimes permit mixed marriages? The Church sometimes permits mixed marriages by granting a dispensation for very grave reasons and under special conditions. 312. Can any human power dissolve the bond of marriage? No human power can dissolve the bond of marriage because Christ has said, What God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Matthew 19. 6. Chapter 7 of Virtues and Vices 313. Which are the theological virtues? The theological virtues are faith, hope, and charity. 1 Corinthians 13.13. 13. 314. Why are they called theological virtues? They are called theological virtues because they relate immediately to God. 315. What are the chief mysteries of faith which every Christian is bound to know? The chief mysteries of faith which every Christian is bound to know are the unity and trinity of God, who will render to every man according to his works, and the incarnation, death, and resurrection of our Saviour. 
316. Which are the cardinal virtues? The cardinal virtues are prudence, justice, fortitude and temperance. Wisdom, 8, 7. 317. Why are they called cardinal virtues? They are called cardinal virtues because they are, as it were, the hinges on which all other moral virtues turn. 318. Which are the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost? The seven gifts of the Holy Ghost are Wisdom, Understanding, Counsel, Fortitude, Knowledge, Piety, The Fear of the Lord. Isaiah 11, 2 and 3. 319. Which are the twelve fruits of the Holy Ghost? The twelve fruits of the Holy Ghost are Charity, Joy, Peace, Patience, Benignity, Goodness, Longanimity, Mildness, Faith, Modesty, Continency, and Chastity. Galatians 5, 22. 320. Which are the two great precepts of charity? The two great precepts of charity are 1. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, and with thy whole soul, and with thy whole mind, and with thy whole strength. 2. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. Mark 12, 30, 31. 321. Which are the seven corporal works of mercy? The seven corporal works of mercy are to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to harbour the harbourless, to visit the sick, to visit the imprisoned, to bury the dead. Matthew 25, 35 and 36 and Tobias 12, 12. 322. Which are the seven spiritual works of mercy? The seven spiritual works of mercy are to convert the sinner, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to comfort the sorrowful, to bear wrongs patiently, to forgive injuries, to pray for the living and the dead. 323. Which are the eight Beatitudes? The eight Beatitudes are 1. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 2. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. 3. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. 4. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall have their fill. 5. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain a mercy. 6. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. 7. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. 8. Blessed are they that suffer persecution for justice's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, 3-10 324. Which are the seven capital sins or vices and their contrary virtues? The seven capital sins or vices and their contrary virtues are 1. Pride, contrary virtue, humility. 2. Covetousness, contrary virtue, liberality. 3. Lust, contrary virtue, chastity. 4. Anger, Contrary virtue, meekness. 5. Gluttony. Contrary virtue, temperance. 6. Envy. Contrary virtue, brotherly love. 7. Sloth. Contrary virtue, diligence. 325. Why are they called capital sins? They are called capital sins because they are the sources from which all other sins take their rise. 326. Which are the six sins against the Holy Ghost? 
The six sins against the Holy Ghost are 1. Presumption 2. Despair 3. Resisting the known truth 4. Envy of another's spiritual good 5. Obstinacy in sin 6. Final impenitence 327. Which are the four sins crying to heaven for vengeance? The four sins crying to heaven for vengeance are 1. Willful murder, Genesis 4 2. The sin of Sodom, Genesis 18 3. Oppression of the poor, Exodus 2 4. Defrauding labourers of their wages, James 5 328. When are we answerable for the sins of others? We are answerable for the sins of others whenever we either cause them or share in them through our own fault. 329. In how many ways may we either cause or share the guilt of another's sin? We may either cause or share the guilt of another's sin in nine ways. 1. By counsel. 2. By command. 3. By consent. 4. By provocation. 5. By praise or flattery. 6. By concealment. 7. By being a partner in the sin. 8. By silence. 9. By defending the ill done. 330. Which are the three eminent good works? The three eminent good works are prayer, fasting, and alms deeds. 331. Which are the evangelical counsels? The evangelical counsels are voluntary poverty, perpetual chastity, and entire obedience. 332. What are the four last things to be ever remembered? The four last things to be ever remembered are death, judgment, hell, and heaven. Ecclesiasticus 7. End of section 6. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Section 7 of The Penny Catechism, A Catechism of Christian Doctrine by the Catholic Truth Society. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Chapter 8. The Christian's Rule of Life. 333. What rule of life must we follow if we hope to be saved? If we hope to be saved, we must follow the rule of life taught by Jesus Christ. 334. What are we bound to do by the rule of life taught by Jesus Christ? By the rule of life taught by Jesus Christ, we are bound always to hate sin and to love God. 335. How must we hate sin? We must hate sin above all other evils, so as to be resolved never to commit a willful sin, for the love or fear of anything whatsoever. 336. How must we love God? We must love God above all things and with our whole heart. 337. How must we learn to love God? We must learn to love God by begging of God to teach us to love Him. O oh my God, teach me to love Thee. 338. What will the love of God lead us to do? The love of God will lead us often to think how good God is, often to speak to Him in our hearts and always to seek to please him. 339. Does Jesus Christ also command us to love one another? Jesus Christ also commands us to love one another, that is, all persons, without exception, for his sake. 340. How are we to love one another? We are to love one another by wishing well to one another, and praying for one another, and by never allowing ourselves any thought, word or deed to the injury of anyone. 341. Are we also bound to love our enemies? We are also bound to love our enemies, not only by forgiving them from our hearts, but also by wishing them well 
and praying for them. 342. Has Jesus Christ given us another great rule? Jesus Christ has given us another great rule in these words. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke 9, 23. 343. How are we to deny ourselves? We are to deny ourselves by giving up our own will and by going against our own humours, inclinations and passions. 344. Why are we bound to deny ourselves? We are bound to deny ourselves because our natural inclinations are prone to evil from our very childhood, and, if not corrected by self-denial, they will certainly carry us to hell. 345. How are we to take up our cross daily? We are to take up our cross daily by submitting daily with patience to the labours and sufferings of this short life, and by bearing them willingly for the love of God. 346. How are we to follow our blessed Lord? We are to follow our blessed Lord by walking in his footsteps and imitating his virtues. 347. What are the principal virtues we are to learn of our blessed Lord? The principal virtues which we are to learn of our blessed Lord are meekness, humility and obedience. 348. Which are the enemies we must fight against all the days of our life? The enemies which we must fight against all the days of our life are the devil, the world and the flesh. 349. What do you mean by the devil? By the devil I mean Satan and all his wicked angels, who are ever seeking to draw us into sin, that we may be damned with them. 350. What do you mean by the world? By the world I mean the false maxims of the world, and the society of those who love the vanities, riches and pleasures of this world better than God. 351. Why do you number the devil and the world amongst the enemies of the soul? I number the devil and the world amongst the enemies of the soul because they are always seeking, by temptation and by word or example, to carry us along with them in the broad road that leads to damnation. 352. What do you mean by the flesh? By the flesh I mean our own corrupt inclinations and passions, which are the most dangerous of all our enemies. 353. What must we do to hinder the enemies of our soul from drawing us into sin? To hinder the enemies of our soul from drawing us into sin, we must watch, pray, and fight against all their suggestions and temptations. 354. In the warfare against the devil, the world, and the flesh, on whom must we depend? In the warfare against the devil, the world, and the flesh, we must depend not on ourselves, but on God only. I can do all things in him who strengtheneth me. Philippians 4.13 Chapter 9. The Christian's Daily Exercise 355. How should you begin the day? I should begin the day by making the sign of the cross as soon as I awake in the morning, and by saying some short prayer such as, O oh my God, I offer my heart and soul to Thee. 356. How should you rise in the morning? I should rise in the morning diligently, dress myself modestly, and then kneel down and say my morning prayers. 357. Should you also hear Mass if you have time and opportunity? I should also hear Mass if I have time and opportunity, for to hear Mass is by far the best and most profitable of all devotions. 358. Is it useful to make daily meditation? It is useful to make daily meditation, for such was the practice of all the saints. 359. On what ought we to meditate? We ought to meditate especially on the four last things, and the life and passion of our blessed Lord. 360. Ought we frequently to read good books? We ought frequently to read good books, such as the Holy Gospels, the Lives of the Saints, and other spiritual works, which nourish our faith and piety, and arm us against the false maxims of the world. 
361. And what should you do as to your eating, drinking, sleeping, and amusements? As to my eating, drinking, sleeping, and amusements, I should use all these things with moderation and with a desire to please God. 362. Say the grace before meals. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts, which we are going to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. 363. Say the grace after meals. We give thee thanks, Almighty God, for all thy benefits, who livest and reignest, world without end. Amen. May the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. 364. How should you sanctify your ordinary actions and employments of the day? I should sanctify my ordinary actions and employments of the day by often raising up my heart to God whilst I am about them and saying some short prayer to him. 365. What should you do when you find yourself tempted to sin? When I find myself tempted to sin, I should make the sign of the cross on my heart and call on God as earnestly as I can, saying, Lord, save me, or I perish. 366. If you have fallen into sin, what should you do? If I have fallen into sin, I should cast myself in spirit at the feet of Christ and humbly beg his pardon by a sincere act of contrition. 367. When God sends you any cross, or sickness, or pain, what should you say? When God sends me any cross, or sickness, or pain, I should say, Lord, thy will be done. I take this for my sins. 368. What little indulgence prayers would you do well to say often to yourself during the day? I should do well to say often to myself during the day such little indulgence prayers as Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In all things may the most holy, the most just, and the most lovable will of God be done, praised and exalted above all forever. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. Praised be Jesus Christ, praised for evermore. My Jesus, mercy, Mary, help. 369. How should you finish the day? I should finish the day by kneeling down and saying my night prayers. 370. After your night prayers, what should you do? After my night prayers, I should observe due modesty in going to bed, occupy myself with the thoughts of death, and endeavour to compose myself to rest at the foot of the cross, and give my last thoughts to my crucified Saviour. End of section 7. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Section 8 of The Penny Catechism, a Catechism of Christian Doctrine by the Catholic Truth Society. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. Appendix The Confiteor I confess to Almighty God, to Blessed Mary ever a Virgin, to Blessed Michael the Archangel, to Blessed John the Baptist, to the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, and to all the saints, that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I beseech Blessed Mary ever a Virgin, Blessed Michael the Archangel, Blessed John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, and all the saints, to pray to the Lord our God for me. Amen. An Act of Faith I firmly believe there is one God, and that in this one God there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, that the Son took to himself the nature of man from the womb of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Ghost, and that in this our human nature he was crucified and died for us, that afterwards he rose again and ascended into heaven, from whence he shall come to repay the just with everlasting glory and the wicked with everlasting punishment. Moreover, 
I believe whatsoever else the Catholic Church proposes to be believed, and this because God, who is the sovereign truth, and can neither deceive nor be deceived, has revealed all these things to this his church. An act of hope. O my God, relying on thine almighty power and thine infinite mercy and goodness, and because thou art faithful to thy promises, I trust in thee that thou wilt grant me the forgiveness of my sins, through the merits of Jesus Christ thy Son, and that thou wilt give me the assistance of thy grace, with which I may labour to continue to the end in the diligent exercise of all good works, and may deserve to obtain in heaven the glory which thou hast promised. An act of charity. O Lord my God, I love thee with my whole heart, and above all things, because thou, O God, art the sovereign good, and for thine own infinite perfections art most worthy of all love. And for thy sake I also love my neighbour as myself. An act of contrition. O my God, I am sorry and beg pardon for all my sins, and detest them above all things, because they deserve thy dreadful punishments, because they have crucified my loving Saviour Jesus Christ, and most of all because they offend thine infinite goodness, and I firmly resolve by the help of thy grace never to offend thee again, and carefully to avoid the occasions of sin. The Divine Praises Blessed be God, blessed be his holy name, Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the great mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be the name of Mary, virgin and mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. The Angelus Domini The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived of the Holy Ghost. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ thy Son was made known by the message of an angel, may, by his passion and cross, be brought to the glory of his resurrection. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. The Regina Chaley, to be said standing during Paschal time instead of the Angelus. Queen of heaven, rejoice. Alleluia. For he whom thou wast made worthy to bear. Alleluia. Hath arisen, as he said. Alleluia. Pray for us to God. Alleluia. Rejoice and be glad, O Virgin Mary. Alleluia. For the Lord is truly risen. Alleluia. Let us pray. O God, who through the resurrection of thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, hast vouchsafed to give joy to the whole world, grant us, we beseech thee, that through the intercession of the Virgin Mary, his mother, we may obtain the joys of eternal life, through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. The Salve Regina Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, hail our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this vale of tears. Turn then, most gracious Advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us, and after this our exile show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. The Memorare Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that any one who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession, was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. 
To thee I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. The Magnificat My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, because he hath regarded the humility of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, because he that is mighty hath done great things to me, and holy is his name and his mercy is from generation unto generations to them that fear him. He hath shown might in his arm, he hath scattered the proud of the conceit of their heart. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He hath received Israel his servant, being mindful of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed for ever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The De Profundis Out of the depths I have cried to thee, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If thou, O Lord, shalt observe iniquities, Lord, who shall endure it? For with thee there is merciful forgiveness and by reason of thy law I have waited for thee, O Lord. My soul hath relied on his word, my soul hath hoped in the Lord. From the morning watch, even until night, let Israel hope in the Lord. Because with the Lord there is mercy, and with him plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Eternal rest give unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace, Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come unto thee. Let us pray. O God, the Creator and Redeemer of all the faithful, grant to the souls of thy servants departed the remission of all their sins, that through pious supplications they may obtain the pardon which they have always desired, who livest and reignest world without end. Amen. A Morning Offering O Jesus, through the most pure heart of Mary, I offer thee the prayers, works, and sufferings of this day for all the intentions of thy divine heart. Aspiration Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, assist me in my last agony. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, may I die in peace and in your blessed company. End of section 8 Recording by David S. Oderberg, Tidmarsh, England. End of the Penny Catechism, a catechism of Christian doctrine by the Catholic Truth Society.